Go ahead and touch, touch where the nails went in. Go ahead, put your hand where the spear went in. Think about the people who have never seen me, but they still believe. But thank God for the Thomases. Because wouldn't you, wouldn't you like to see Jesus? What would it do for your faith if you actually saw him and touched those same spots? those marks from 2,000 years ago. Would that influence the way you behave today? Would it influence the way you live your life? Would it influence just literally the things you do every single day? I sure hope so. I would hope that if you ran into and it's, it had the moment with the resurrected Jesus Christ, that it would radically change who you are every day of your life. And Jesus says to Thomas, Thomas, how blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. I was 12 years old when Kenny Keim died. Kenny was a, he got in trouble a lot. He really kind of was one of those troublemaker kids. And in some ways, a lot of people didn't really like Kenny because he was this troublemaker. Kenny suddenly died. A lot of our friends went to the funeral, and we learned there that in very recent time before Kenny died, he had committed his life to Jesus Christ. Four years later, I was standing at a cemetery, and I was uncomfortable walking over to my pastor because his four-year-old son had died up here in the mountains at Lake Arrowhead. Suddenly stopped breathing and they were, never did find out what caused his death. Four years old. And here I was, a young guy, and I cared about my pastor, but I had no idea what to say to him. And I stood off and watched. I remember one time when he was off standing by a tree by the graveside, and I'm standing over here still about 20 yards away and caught eyes with him. Sometimes words just aren't there, are they? I also remember the, um, well, I just went blank. I'm sorry. It's a program. Shucks. <laughs> Some of you will remember what kind of program it is. I'm totally blanking on the title of it now. And it was a program where they did you know, suspenseful things, and it was a nighttime program. Somebody's going to remember, right? It's not truth or consequences, by the way. <laughs> what? Nope. <laughs> it wasn't a game show. So, thank you. A man of my own age. <laughs> So there was, kids, there was this program called Twilight Zone. They used to do suspenseful things on the Twilight Zone. And the, and the show that really caught my attention was the show where they had a prison. It was out in the desert, really barren place. And people did everything they could to break out of there, and no one could. But one guy came up with a plan, and his plan was worked out with the mortician from the prison. Because there were regularly guys dying there. It was the one way you could get out. So he worked it out with a matrician, and the next time a prisoner died, he climbed into the box where that man was that had died. His friend takes him, buries him, and then is supposed to come back in a few hours to dig him up and set him free. He has some type of a candle there in his box, so there's some things that he can do to kind of t t see what's happening. And he says, you know, this is going on a lot longer. A lot longer. A lot longer. And 
now he's starting to get upset, and he's rolling over inside this little space in this box. And to his chagrin, the body next to him is his friend. And I got to tell you, that has marked a lot of my thoughts about dying. <laughs> I don't want to be put in a box. I don't want to be stuck underground. And I'm not sure I want to be burned up either. <laughs> and so over the years, I, I don't know about you, but I've had some uncomfortable feelings about dying. I just want to keep living. Wouldn't that be easier? It would really be nice if Jesus just came back and we could move from here to there. You know, like, like second, you know, Thessalonians says. Wouldn't that just be the kind of the fun way to do it? But the whole idea about dying, in, and incidentally, I'm sure all of you are experts on dying. So if, if somebody here has died and, and been dead for a significant period of time, and you've come back to life, you might want to help me with this message. So could I see a show of hands? Okay, then we're going to have to trust the word <laughs> and see what the Lord may want to say to us. But I wonder how many of us have had a time in our life when we were uncomfortable with the thought of death. The gravesite is a painful place, isn't it? Cody, eight and a half years old, my nephew, he was that close that close to living. His first heart surgery was when he was a week old. He had half a heart. It was in backwards. Other organs were upside down. It was just crazy how God had created this little boy's body. He went through multiple surgeries, and the final surgery was one that had all the chambers recreated, and Cody was going to be able to survive. The surgery was a success. They completed all the chamber work on his heart. And all he needed to do was to heal. Lord God, right now, you know whatever that siren is going for. You know the emergency that's taking place at this moment. You know the people who may be in crisis. You know if somebody literally is at the point of life and death. And Lord, I pray your protection on those men as they travel, the paramedics and the firefighters. I pray your protection on those who are on scene right now. I pray your blessing of peace for those who are in the midst of the crisis. May they feel your comfort, sense your presence. May somebody on Resurrection Day communicate life to whomever's in need there, their family and whoever might be in the crisis. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. And all Cody needed to do was heal. And after all these other surgeries, it seemed like that should have been the easy thing. I mean, his heart was now like a normal heart. And he couldn't heal. And the sternum became infected. And for the last month of his life, his rib cage was pulled open with plastic over this area as they tried to get the infection out of there. Eight and a half years old. And we stood there at his grave. And there were, what was it, a hundred kids that were at Cody's service. I did say he was my nephew, did I? And we stood there at his grave. What parent, what parent can handle that moment? It's not the way it's supposed to be. Parents, grandparents die before children, right? I mean, we know that's the order. Us older people die before the younger people. That's just the way it's supposed to be. And here's a young boy. <laughs> Cody's favorite toy was a rope. A rope. He was easy to buy for. <laughs> there was a one day when he was playing on a t-ball team and he got a hit. And dad picked him up. And ran him to first base. And as they cheered, dad ran him to second base. And around the third, and finally home. And Cody had scored a run. All he needed to do was heal. 
I, I frankly don't like death. I don't know about you. I don't like it. But what we want to see is that there's something that happens with death when you know Jesus Christ. Call it a coincidence, okay? We'll not give any, any supernatural credit to this, but it was a really cool coincidence. We unleashed, uh, it was like, I think about 100 helium balloons. I, I think they were legal, protected ones. If not, I, do, I don't take any, any responsibility. <laughs> But we unleashed about 100 helium balloons after we buried Cody. And we're standing there watching the balloons. <laughs> and just kind of a weird thing happened. One white balloon separated itself from all the other balloons and looked as if it was going up ahead of all the rest. Well, that's just a cool coincidence. But it sure was a moment to think of something, wasn't it? And for us to think about the fact that this little boy that we loved had gone on ahead of the rest of us to, to heaven. Because Cody believed that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in him, though he die, yet shall he live. For he who believes in him will never die. Young people, if you, um, and maybe some of you older kids, how many of you play video games? <laughs> Show your hands, come on, be honest. How many of those video games kill people? How many of those video games are you the person doing the killing and you get killed? <laughs> and here's one of the problems. With, your, with our video games, all we have to do is hit the reset button. And eventually, you'll learn how to master that game. But the problem with that is life doesn't have a reset button. You can't start the game over now and pretend that you never died and get 10 more lives and more power and more guns and weapons and all. It just doesn't work that way. And in the process, we've also, I even think that maybe young people, they maybe don't have the same kind of concern with death and dying like some of the older people do. Because well, all you gotta do is start the game over. I mean, th there's blood all over the place anyways and we're, we're just gonna kill a whole bunch of people and then if I'm the one who gets killed, so what? I can just start it over. And there might be a theological principle there, but the start over is once. And the start over again is through, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. For he who believes in me will never die. The idea of, tr of dying can be troubling. The fact is, is that none of us have died. Taken the journey from here to heaven. And come back to explain what we saw and experienced. Oh, in case you're thinking, yeah, but there are some who have had experiences like that. Not long ago, there was a book that was written and a research project that was done in which they actually went and interviewed people right after they had near-death experiences. They then came back and interviewed those same people a significant period of time later to see what their stories were like. What was interesting about this was is that as they interviewed people, some of those people, their interview went something like this. It was frightening. It was horrible. It was terrible on the other side. And I came back to life. Later when interviewed, I saw a white light. It was beautiful. Everything was beautiful. It was peaceful. It was wonderful. I can't wait to go there. Now what happened from the moment after the near-death experience to later? Something had changed. There were others who had said, I saw Jesus. I saw Jesus. But he said to go back. Later when interviewed, I saw Jesus. I saw a bright light. I'm sure it was Jesus. And he said, go back. You can do some research on this yourself and see if I'm telling you the truth about this book. But notice that there are some who have an experience that they think at the moment was terrible, but later they think was wonderful. Let's take note. And may I also warn you, 
that Satan masquerades like an angel of light. <clears throat> Romans 8.11 says, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Here's the cool thing. You will live because Jesus lives. It's not a nice story, folks. It's a fact. It's truth. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit, they're all involved in this event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Listen to how Paul prays for us. He says in Ephesians 1.18, I pray that the eyes of your heart, not just these eyes, but the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Now, keep listening. Paul is praying that we would have power. Listen to what the power is. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Paul's praying that you and I would experience the power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead and that that power would give us hope. That power would cause us to be able to see and understand and our hearts would be open. And he says he's placed Christ at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Folks, the spirit of Jesus Christ wants to give you and me life. Did you see how he said it in that text? He says he wants to affect our mortal body. This body here, the one that feels pain, the one that gets frustrated and upset, the one that ultimately will die. Philippians says it this way. I want to know Christ, Paul says. Yes. To know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Paul's about to be killed. And he's saying, I want to know the resurrection power that's going to take me through this suffering to heaven. In another text, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, listen, I tell you a mystery. By the way, you want to know about life after death? Uh, listen to somebody who talked to somebody who had died, Jesus Christ. Here's Paul, had spent time with Jesus Christ, had seen him on the road to Damascus. And he says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. That means be dead. But we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written is come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Where, O oh, death, is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Did it hurt when Kenny died? Did it hurt when my pastor's son died? Did it hurt when Cody died? Of course it did. The sting of death will be defeated by the victory of Jesus Christ. Paul goes on, he says, we need to live because Jesus is alive. Romans 8, 12 to 13 now. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. But it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. We have an obligation, he says. An obligation not to allow the body, and you know the body kind of does bad things at times. Every one of us. Not to allow the body to control us, but instead to be controlled by the Spirit. Folks, you don't owe your body anything. You don't have to feed it that addiction, whatever it might be, that you think you have to have. 
the extra ice cream, the chocolate cake, the cocaine, whatever. You, you don't have to feed it that extra thing. William McDonald echoes these thoughts. He says, the flesh is nothing. The old evil corrupt nature has been nothing but a drag. It has never done us a bit of good. If Christ had not saved us, the flesh would have dragged us down to the deepest, darkest, hottest places in hell. Why should we feel obligated to such an enemy? Someone said Jesus paid a debt that he did not owe. And we owed a debt that we could not pay. Wayne Barber talking about the flesh and this battle that, that every single person here fights. You look around the room. You know, if you look at everybody else here, you'd say, oh, they're all wonderful. They're not as bad as me, right? And we may think that, oh, everyone else does so much better than us. They're so spiritual and all. And yet we all have this same battle. The flesh, Barber says, can still coerce us, but it cannot control one who is in Jesus Christ. So because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, we don't owe it, meaning the flesh, a thing. We are debtors, yes, but not to the flesh. The truth is that the only thing that the flesh has ever done for any of us is to draw us downward toward death. Thank God that he has come into our life to save us from the power, from its power, and we don't owe the flesh anything. If Christ had not saved us, the flesh would have dragged us into hell. Flesh has never done one thing good for us. Everything the flesh ever did for us was to injure and hurt us. The wording that, that Paul's using here in in Verses 12 and 13, he's saying, you have this obligation, and it's a legal term. You have a legal obli obligation to live according to the Spirit, he says. Why? Because Jesus died for you. Because Jesus paid the price for your sin. And we owe no debt to our flesh, but to him only. And it's a debt we frankly cannot pay. So in order to fight the flesh, what do we We need God's help. By ourselves, we cannot live a supernatural Christian life. Did you know that? You cannot live a supernatural Christian life by yourself. And God never wanted you to. God wants to help you live supernaturally. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Instead of being obligated to the, to the flesh, we're obligated to the Spirit, and by the power of the Spirit, we're able to defeat the flesh. Well, you think about that. I could go on for a while, but I won't. Paul goes on, and he says, we need to learn to live like God's children. You. You are a child of the King, the Lord of Lords. Romans 8, 14 says it this way, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. If you said yes to Jesus Christ in your life, the Spirit of God lives in you, and you are the child of God. The Spirit who received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you have received brought about your adoption to sonship. And I know, girls, you're saying, well, I guess we're not included. You have to understand how incredible this is. You are getting the rights that Jesus Christ had. And so he talks about sonship. You are being adopted with all the rights and privileges that Jesus Christ had. And when you receive that, you receive the Spirit. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. I appreciate John MacArthur's caution at this point. He says, as one Christian to another, let me warn you that you will be frustrated by your inability to experience the holiness you crave. If you have Jesus Christ living in you, you want to be more like him. And you crave that, that perfection even, if you will. 
But he says, watch out, MacArthur says, that is the inevitable experience of every true child of God. In your flesh, you will never achieve the level of holiness you want. Uh-oh. Not trying to give you a bad news, just giving you the truth. You're never going to be perfect. You'll never reach the, that amount of holiness that you want, not here. Now here MacArthur goes on, he says, but press on. Persevere in your faith. And your experience will set you apart as a member of the family of God. And you will experience what it is to really live in Christ. Incidentally, there's a really important order here. Do you see it? First, yes to the Spirit. Then, no to the flesh. Try it the other way around. Try doing no to the flesh. And then trying to say yes to the Spirit. No, it's first, yes, Holy Spirit. Yes, come in and live in me. Yes, empower me. Yes, give me the resources I need to be victorious. And then you can defeat this, the flesh. The other way around, you're probably going to lose. Paul tells us we don't need to be afraid of dying because we've been adopted as children of God who defeated death. We're his children, and we will live because Jesus lives. Paul says it again in 2 Corinthians 4, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. Not only did he die, but he rose from the dead. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have the same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise whom? Not a trick answer. <laughs> the one who raised Jesus from the dead will also raise who? Us. If you want to personalize it, say me, but don't say me. Say me, okay? Christ risen from the dead, and he will also, the Spirit of God will also raise us and present us with him to himself. See, Jesus wants you to live, and he wants you to live fully. He says, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly, that you might have life to the full. Jesus wants us to live. Warren Wearsby said, what a difference it makes in your body when the Holy Spirit lives in you. You experience new life, and even your physical faculties take on a new dimension of experience. When evangelist D.L. Moody described his conversion experience, he said, I was in a new world. The next morning, the sun shone brighter, the birds sang sweeter, the old elms waved their branches for joy, and all nature was at peace. Life in Christ, Wearsby says, is abundant life. Mary and Martha. They sent word to Jesus days ago. Your friend, one of the men that you care most about here is dying. Please come. With that, please is a request, really, that Jesus will get there quickly and heal their brother. Jesus gets the word and waits and waits and then finally he tells his disciples it's now time for us to go to Bethany so we can see what God will do they arrive at Bethany incidentally if you don't know the area Bethany is just a few miles outside of Jerusalem Jesus is on his trek towards Jerusalem to die just a few weeks before that, they arrive at Bethany, and Lazarus is already in the grave. Mary and Martha each come up to Jesus, as you can imagine. If you were the sister of Lazarus, how you'd be brokenhearted. You'd be in tears, even. You're still in that time of mourning, and they did it rather elaborately. You even hired wailers to come and cry. And this went on for several days as she simply grieved over the death of somebody you cared about. 
And part of that grief was because they believed the person was never coming back. It was the end. Mary and Martha both, Jesus, if you had been here, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. There's almost that extra guilt that they're trying to put on Jesus. If you had just come sooner, man, what's with you? Why, why didn't you come when we asked you to come? Why didn't you do what we needed? Why didn't you meet our need like we wanted you to meet our need? Why are you coming now after he's already in the grave? And Jesus will have a conversation with them, and it makes a difference for us. Mary, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, though you die, yet shall you live. For if you believe in me, you will never die. And then Jesus asks the question of Mary and Martha, and really it's a question for you and me. It's a question that separates eternity. When he says back to her, do you believe this? Do you do you believe this? Now Mary will give, excuse me, Martha will give her response. Oh yes, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. I believe that he'll live later on. Oh man, you don't understand. I'm about to do something for you that will be incredible. And as he weeps, he walks to the grave and he brings Lazarus back from the dead. Just to help us to believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. I believe. I believe I'll see Kenny again. I believe I'll see Randall again. And I believe I'll see Cody again. Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. It's the question that matters more than any other. Do you believe this? And if you've never said yes and you want to, I invite you to say yes today. And take note, <laughs> the Spirit of God is drawing you if you're having that urge. The Spirit of God is speaking to you, and the Spirit of God will help you to grow in your believing. Maybe just to make it a little more personal, would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes? And I know everyone says, well, but I want to look when you're saying that. I want to see what's going to happen. You know what? See what's going to happen between you and Jesus right now. If you've never said, I believe, but you want to, you want to believe that there's life after death. You want to believe that Jesus Christ is risen and that he has life planned for you. You say, I want to believe that. Would you raise your hand just to say that? Jesus. You are the resurrection and life. Come. And by the power of your spirit, I pray, not only for those who raised their hands, not only for those who have been living a life believing that you're coming again someday, they've committed their lives to you, but for every single person in this room, that the power of the resurrection would influence us this day to faith and belief and hope and joy and a different view of death. May death lose its sting, and may the victory of your death give us victory today. In Jesus' name, amen.